So before I start, I actually want to make a little plug for a course that's coming up in June. It actually starts May 31st, and it's up at the Sierra Nevada Field Campus of uh, San Francisco State University, so up by Yuba Pass. And it's a week-long intensive course on mushroom identification and focused on the spring fungi of the Sierra Nevada. So you can talk to me more uh, after my talk about it. Uh, I have not, never actually taken the course. I just go up there and hang out every year because it's a really fun group of people. And they're always finding interesting stuff. It's usually a morning lecture um, and then afternoon out to um, into the field to collect fresh specimens. And then you bring them back and work them up in the lab in the late afternoon. And um, yeah, it's a great way to, to really, really become familiar with these fungi, um, some of which I'll be talking about tonight. Um, not cheap, but it is a course for credit um, uh, through San Francisco State. So it's a great opportunity, and I hope that some of you will take advantage of it. And uh, I believe that there are brochures on the back table for the Sierra Nevada Field Campus, which is where this uh, great class takes place. And um, they offer courses throughout the summer months on a bunch of different topics, everything from watercolor painting to entomology to mycology. So um, if you're interested in being up in a beautiful place for a weekend or a week and taking some of these courses, I highly recommend it. So anyway, what I'm talking about tonight, um, fire. Fire and fungi and their interactions. And um, I know that fire's been on a lot of people's minds, probably everybody's mind in this area, all over the state of California with the you know, huge wildfires that we've been having, especially in the past couple of years. Um, so I wanna talk about uh, which fungi come in right after fire, which ones don't do so well with fire, and how fire has changed um, in the way it behaves, thanks to human intervention, of course and a little bit about uh, fungal ecology in general and fire ecology in general. So I took this picture up in Oregon. I was up there for the solar eclipse and uh, that was my view from the top of my car right by my campsite. Uh, we were uh, about 20 miles north of this fire. So as you can imagine, seeing that glow from that distance, that was a pretty big blaze. And um, one of many that blanketed the entire state of Oregon in smoke that summer. Yeah. So some of you might well remember that well. So I'm gonna start with the fire part, which may be very familiar to many of you, but I don't expect it to be familiar to everybody. So the history of fire in California is one of profound change, and our landscape was absolutely shaped by fire. Shaped, you know, from the time, first time that people first got here, which it turns out we keep pushing the date further and further back when we figure people first arrived in California. So it's been a long time uh, ever since the retreat of the ice sheets, really. And uh, we've really seen a shift in the just last 150 years in what we call the fire regime. And I define the fire regime as the frequency, intensity, and pattern of fires that prevail in an area. So the general pattern, the general kinds of fires that you see in a particular area. Then with fungi, I'm gonna kind of do a little review of their ecological roles in general, talk about some of the adaptations to fire that fungal species have, and show you some pretty pictures, examples of these fire-following or fire-adapted species, talk a little bit about fungal communities and how they relate to plant communities uh, in different fire and disturbance regimes. Well, we'll see if I accomplish all of this. <laughs> so. Historically in California, we had in most parts of the state, not the entire state, but most parts, a regime that was of frequent low severity fires. This is especially true in the mixed conifer woodlands that are so prevalent in the lower to middle zones of the mountains, also in oak woodlands, um, not so much um, on the far north coast, not so much in Chaparral in Southern California, but in a lot of our ecosystems that we're familiar with, this was absolutely the case. Two sources, people and lightning. The occasional you know, volcanic activity here and there, but mostly people and lightning. Um, so in most of these parts of California that historically burned so frequently, it was mostly because native people were here burning the landscape intentionally. 
their primary land management tool for most most tribes. And it's, I mean, keeps the the forest open, so you can see for hunting. It uh, benefits oak trees over conifers, and if your main staple food source is acorns, that's really helpful. And it <laughs> um, makes it just so you can see for hunting as well as just general safety um, of your group. And also benefits not only oaks that you want for a food source, but many materials that are used in basketry, such as redbud, willow, all of these things that you can coppice or top kill by burning, and then the, after the fire, they sprout back nice and straight, which is exactly what you want for baskets. So yeah, before 1849, pretty much mostly human caused fires in a lot of the state with a lot of lightning fires as well. Um, of course, up on the Sierra Crest and on the eastern side of the Sierra where lightning strikes are most prevalent in the state and there aren't so many people, um, that lightning was a much bigger factor and it continues to be a factor. We still get lightning caused fires every summer pretty much. And yeah, this when we're talking a short returnable interval, we mean short. That's burning every three to 10 years. Three to seven years was considered an average in a lot of forests. This uh, The three year figure, I know it was true in an area just north of Shasta Lake. There was a, a, an analysis of fire scars on uh, dead trees and live trees. And so basically by counting tree rings and noticing where a scar caused by a fire occurred in the tree ring record, and lining that up between a bunch of different trees over this area, they're able to generate a pretty good picture of when there was a fire that affected more than one tree in this area. And so yeah, it was incredibly frequent. But <coughs> in that study and in all the other studies that have been done, every fire did not make every tree develop a scar. So we're talking fires that might have been too low of intensity to burn every tree or just were limited by the amount of fuel and only burned a small area. Um, maybe burn in the fall, later fall or early spring when the fuel moisture is higher. And if you're at all familiar with fire management in California today, these are the exact same conditions under which we burn prescribed fires today. Spring and fall, high fuel moisture so that, that the fire stays low, it doesn't spread too much or too quickly, and it doesn't burn the crowns of the trees. So yeah, very much a fuel limited fire regime. Now of course what happened in 1849, a bunch of white people showed up, brought disease, started killing the native tribes in large numbers, and started to do all of the extractive industries, uh, mining, logging to support the mining, then logging to support development, grazing to support the mining and the logging. Um, but really, until the 1920s or 1930s, there really was no effective fire suppression. Uh, the founding of the US Forest Service really came about in about 1910, 1912, as a response to the big burn in um, Yellowstone area and, and Montana that killed people and really brought the nation's attention to fire management and forests. And by fire management, at that point, everybody meant just put it all out. Don't let a fire burn. So in that intermediate time, after you know, from the gold rush into the early 20th century, um, native people were not burning because they were being killed and um, rushed out of every place they could possibly <coughs> be um, gotten out of. But settlers were still burning. Um, ranchers, early ranchers, often would burn to keep, just like the native people did to keep the forest open, to provide forage for their livestock. Um, but we're getting to what we consider an ignition limited fire regime, where you're not limiting the fire behavior because there's not enough fuel, uh, which was the case previously. You're, you're limiting the amount of fire and fire behavior by not letting fires burn, essentially. Right? You know, limiting the sources of ignition. And by about the 30s, you get into our modern era of complete fire suppression, which is never, of course, truly complete. Um, there's been a decline in the amount of acreage burned, and that includes the last couple of years of really severe wildfires. Less acreage is being burned now 
than was being burned in 1848, um, quite significantly less. Um, but more of those acres burned are being burned in large, high severity fire events. Um, the ones we hear about in the news, the ones that may affect, have affected some people in this room and will almost certainly affect everybody in this room at some point. We have so much fuel on the landscape, it's just sitting there ready to burn. There's been this buildup of small trees um, that aren't being cleared out by periodic fire. And yeah, recently we have started to recognize these problems, especially when we have entire towns burn up. So things are changing, but um, the climate is also changing and warming things up and drying things out, meaning that we're looking forward to more fire. But now we're starting to recognize that if we don't burn under prescribed conditions, if we don't have well-behaved fires, we're looking at more not so well behaved fires. So um, fire management has really, really changed in the time that I've been working for the Forest Service, which is about 10 years. Other land management agencies, including CAL FIRE, are picking it up too. Um, so things are changing. Just see if it's changing quickly enough. So to make this make a little bit more sense, I'll tell you a little bit about what I do and why I get to see so much of California. I do work for the Forest Service as a botanist. I work for the range eco ecology program or the grazing ecology program. I go around the entire state, top to bottom. I revisit these permanent plots that we have, uh, mostly in meadows, also in grassland or prairie ecosystems. And I monitor their condition, how things look. I try to revisit these sites on a five-year schedule the study has been running for 20 years and it is intended to keep going in perpetuity. And uh, over the time that I've been working on this project, which is, this will be my eighth year, um, a lot of our plots have burned over. Uh, I've seen our plots burned in the Rim Fire, some in the King Fire, um, a lot in the uh, Mendocino Complex fires of 2018, actually, on the Mendocino National Forest. But yeah, this uh, sea of dots here represents everywhere that I get to go. Except I'm not sure why there's one out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. That's not real. <laughs> <laughs> I get to go out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. I kind of already mentioned this uh, forest type before as being the one that had such a um, frequent fire uh, regime, really low severity. And um, probably most of us are very familiar with this is because this is where we either live, work, play, um, do something. And this is, yeah, really from about Colfax, Nevada City elevation and up um, to about maybe five or 6,000 feet, depending on where you are, north to south in Sierra Nevada. And it's a mix of uh, some different pines, mostly ponderosa and sugar pine, black oak, infant cedar, white fir, and Douglas fir. And now I thought, I know you thought, you're coming to a mushroom talk, what am I doing talking about plants? But this is, after all, the Native Plant Society. So, um, and of course, our fungal communities and our plant communities are intertwined to the degree that one will not survive without the other, and that goes both ways. So we have um, fungi that are associated with this particular mix of trees, or one of this particular mix of trees, which don't occur anywhere else in the world. Um, this image is of a part of the forest that's managed by the El Dorado Irrigation District. This is down in El Dorado County. And they try to do a prescribed fire in this zone every five to seven years. Um, so you can see a fairly open forest. There are some oak trees shining through. This is in the spring. And um, <coughs> the ground is pretty clear. There are some seedlings, but not a carpet of seedlings. And there is some dust buildup because I think this had been about five years since their last burn when I took this photo. Um, but you can see there are some denser patches. There are some more open patches. We think, and there's some pretty good evidence to suggest this, that this is more what a lot of our forests would have looked like 200 years ago. They might have even, and probably would have been a little bit more open than this even in a lot of places, but this gives you kind of an idea of that. And as a lot of you may know, 
not that easy to find a forest that looks like this around here. Uh, with some thinning projects, that's starting to change. Some prescribed fire projects starting to change, but the vast majority of our woods do not look like this right now. We could say also that the species composition of this has definitely shifted with the suppression of fire. Um, Infant cedar and white fir and Douglas fir have all become more common. These trees are more shade tolerant. They can develop more easily with a closed forest canopy over them. Whereas black oak is really suffering because it is not shade tolerant at all. For a seedling of it to grow, it really needs full sun um, and a lot of light um, with some, some open space around it. Ponderosa pine and sugar pine also really require bare mineral soil and some lots of light open spaces to grow. So, yeah. Moving up the slope, this is where I spend most of my summers, um, my happy zone. <laughs> this is where um, lightning starts to enter the picture in a much more, um, much bigger fashion. Because you're right on the crest, lightning strikes are happening all the time especially if we get summer monsoons that bring thunderstorms. They, they bring rain from the southwest, uh, from Arizona and New Mexico, but they also bring um, electrical activity, uh, lightning and thunder. So we get a lot of lodgepole pine up here and stands of red fir. Um, the other, other trees here don't necessarily form such pure stands as lodgepole pine and red fir do, but uh, lodgepole pine in California is not a completely fire adapted species. The lodgepole pine in the Rocky Mountains, which is a different subspecies, same species, is really truly um, adapted to infrequent, very severe fire that kills all the mature trees. And then the cones open, they're called serotonous cones, they open with heat, and after the fire, then they just sprout up in a carpet. Our lodgepole pines can do that too, but our lodgepole pines in the Sierra Nevada, their cones do open even without fire. At least some of them do. So they can regenerate um, without having a fire come through. And they can survive some low severity fire, but their bark is very thin. They don't do so well surviving a fire as mature trees. So they just have a different approach and um, yeah, came to exist in places that saw fire still frequently, but not as frequently as lower down. Red fir is fairly resistant to fire, um, and often it seems that with um, studies of fire scars in different forest types that are adjacent to one another in these high elevations, uh, that the different tree, uh, different forest types will actually have different fire return intervals. So one is burning a little bit more frequently than the other. And why that is, if it's just, you know, a lightning sparked fire that got put out by a rainstorm, or um, one is slightly more susceptible to uh, fire and dries out quicker, sure. Um, but yeah, this is um, yeah, this is a different zone and a lot of similarities, a lot of overlap with fungal communities between here and lower down, but there's also some distinct differences. So yeah, the King Fire, many of us probably remember this burned in El Dorado National Forest and a little bit onto the Tahoe National Forest in September of 2014. It uh, started down in Pollock Pines and uh, proceeded to burn up a lot of the South Fork of the American River Canyon and the Rubicon River Canyon. Um, it yeah, started the 13th of September. It was arson and um, started near Pollock Pines. And once it got into the Rubicon Canyon, it just took off. The winds changed, and all of a sudden we had 40,000 acres burned in one day. Um, so it wasn't like it was a low severity fire before that, but that just incredible blowing up, and that's when it made that really long run up that canyon. Up to, this is French Meadows Reservoir, Hull Hole Reservoir here, and um, Chipmunk Ridge is between them. So that's kind of where the fire basically ran out of fuel because it ran into the rocky ridge top there and couldn't go any further. So yes, there were lots of high severity uh, areas of this fire, especially on ridge tops. Most of the upper Georgetown divide absolutely got fried. Um, but there were areas, as you can see in this previous slide, where this is 
uh, part that burned pretty early on in the fire before the big blow up. And you can see there's still some green crowns in here. Some of these trees made it. Fire burned where I was standing. Um, some of the trees are scorched, but not everything's totally scorched. Where you can see further up here, as you go up the canyon, it just absolutely everything is just gone. So I'm going to show you a lot of photos that I took after the King Fire. That's one of the reasons I wanted to mention it. Um, also, it's a fire that many of us remember. It's close to home, and it's a good example of extreme fire behavior that we're seeing today in these larger blazes. So now to switch gears a little bit, talking about fungal ecology and fungal behavior. <laughs> this slide is, uh, does not contain species that are fire adapted. I use this slide in other talks and I use it as a kind of an introduction to the nutritional modes of mushroom forming fungi. Um, most of us have heard of decomposers, that fungi are, are decomposers in the woods. And that's these, the saprotrophs, feeding on dead matter. That's exactly what saprotroph means. Um, there are gilled mushrooms that do this. There are cut fungi that do this. There are you know, different form groups that aren't necessarily related closely to one another that behave like this and get their nutrition this way. Um, but yeah, they're out there doing the same thing, munching on our logs, our needle fall, all sorts of litter. We have ectomycorrhizal fungi. These are the ones with, with which trees could not live and the fungi could not live without the trees. This is not true of every tree and certainly not of every fungus. The, uh, this particular type of mycorrhizal relationship, ectomycorrhizal, is only found in a, about a dozen plant families around the world. And where we live, it's mostly the pine family and the oak family. So as you can imagine, that's a good chunk of our trees in the state of California. Um, there's a slightly different kind of mycorrhizal relationship that involves madrone and manzanita. Um, so that's also really prevalent in our area. Um, but yes, a lot of these are the things most prized by mushroom hunters, the king bolete, such as this, um, chanterelles, matsutake, the things that mushroom hunters go mad for. Uh, a lot of them are ectomycorrhizal. They're associated with living trees. And that's one of the reasons that, that they're so highly prized and so expensive if you try to buy them in the market because they cannot be cultivated without their tree partners. So mm -hmm. they have to be collected in the wild. Now, parasites and pathogens. This is just a particularly showy example of a parasite. Um, we have fungi that are parasites on other fungi. We have fungi that are parasites on animals, as this one is. We have um, tree pathogens. We have um, you know, things like rust fungi and um, plant pathogens in general. But yeah, this one is a um, parasite on moth larvae and moth pupae. And um, it's really apparently quite rare in Western North America, except that I find it every year <laughs> in the same spot, <laughs> um, in a spot that would have been flooded out by the creation of the Auburn Dam. So, <laughs> yeah, it's just an oddball. So now, moving on from just general information about fungi, we have some that follow fire in particular. This is probably why most of you came here, to hear about these guys tonight. Um, there are a lot of names that get thrown around for these fungi, and I mention them uh, partially because you will see these Latin and Greek uh, roots in these names up here. You'll see them in the names of the fungi. A lot of things will be, you know, Anthracophila, Carbonicola, and so spelling them out all here, we have, you know, Pyrophilus, so fire loving, Carbonicolus, cold welling. In Europe, they've um, tended to call them fireplace fungi um, <laughs> and or phenicoid fungi as of the phoenix. Um, they, they do occur as a group worldwide. They're not limited to Western North America. Some of the species are limited to different parts of the world, but this phenomenon of fungi that come up after fire is a worldwide phenomenon, absolutely. And there's been actually a lot of research done on these fire-following fungi in, in Europe, 
in North America and in Australia. And um, Australia and California share a lot of research, both in terms of fungi and in terms of fire ecology, because we have similar um, climates. And at least part of Australia has a very Mediterranean climate like we do here too. And so there's been a lot of trading of, of knowledge and lessons learned and mistakes back and forth. And um, that seems to be continuing after this most recent really destructive season of wildfires in Australia. So when I was learning forestry and fire science in college, which is about 10 years ago now, um, we were thinking that maybe Australia had it figured out better than <laughs> we did here. <laughs> and that, that seems not to have been the case. Um, but a lot of that's just due to changing conditions and um, extreme drought and climate change and more people moving out into these um, areas that are um, not urban, that are rural and in, in wildlands. So anyway, fungi that are adapted to the effects of fire ha um, have to deal with a certain set of conditions. Uh, heating of the soil, sterilization of the soil, uh, at least the top layer of soil. And of course, this varies a lot with the severity of the fire. So some fungi can absolutely survive a low severity fire um, just fine. You know, only the top little bit of the soil is getting scorched. Everything that's an inch or two down is just fine. In a high severity uh, fire, you might have the top several inches of soil being absolutely cooked. So some species can deal with that. Um, with ash deposition after a fire, you get a big nutrient flush that's accompanied by a shift in pH. So there's all of a sudden a lot of available nitrogen and phosphorus, but in order to take advantage of those extra nutrients, you have to be able to handle um, a pretty alkaline environment. We also have the removal of litter and duff. I was talking about this for plant species earlier with pine trees that need bare mineral soil in which to, for their seeds to germinate. Uh, some of these fungi also benefit from uh, all the duff being gone and a lot more light exposure, a lot more uh, soil warming just from the sun. Um, of course, you have plant mortality. <coughs> this can mean mortality of tree host um, for a fungal species that's mycorrhizal with that tree. It can also mean a reduction in competition because you don't have roots of other plant species trying to take up water and nutrients there. So it can be both benefit and drawback. And I mentioned that these have been studied in Europe. They were actually first described as a group, as an ecological group of species in Germany in 1949 by Meinhard Moser, who was a well-known mycologist. And then um, a Danish guy Danish mycologist Peterson in 1970 did another publication that kind of uh, solidified this as a group that we should recognize and be paying attention to. So some of the adaptations that these fungi have for fire are what we call sclerotia, um, or basically a resistant resting stage that can make it through fire. It might be cracked open by fire, but then is ready to germinate after the fire has passed. Thick-walled spores is a different resting stage because it's a reproductive propagule rather than um, vegetative, which would be the sclerotia um, way of doing things. Um, I'll show you an example of some of these thick-walled spores in a minute here. Uh, dark spores, fungi produce melanin um, the same way that animals do. Fungi and animals are close relatives. We're each other's closest relatives. And fungi have a lot of the same pathways that animals do for production of, um, of different compounds. It's not just melanin. Um, our vitamin D production pathway is the same, as you might have suspected, given the production of melanin and other pigments. Uh, we also, um, not us, but other animals, crustaceans, produce chitin. That's their shell um, material, and fungi are are predominantly composed of chitin and other proteins. So, yeah, they're our buddies, our cousins. So, um, I would mentioned the extra availability of nutrients. So, fungi that can that are there and, and um, benefiting from this situation have to have be able to kind of step up 
their uh, processing of all of these available nutrients to grab them before they wash away in a rainstorm or are leached out just uh, by exposure to air and sunlight. It seems, although the research isn't all that clear on this, that some fungi can actually shift their nutritional mode or have their fruiting triggered by the death of their plant host. This would, of course, be for species that are mycorrhizal, that are associated with a tree. Um, so it seems that they can flip a switch. There's something hormonal going on that if their host is killed, that can trigger them to just produce fruiting bodies uh, soon after if the condition's right, or it shifts to a different nutritional mode. Morels, some species of morels seem to be the ones that can do this, mm -hmm. where part of their life cycle, they're associated with the roots of living trees, and then part of their life cycle, they don't need a living tree host. So that may be one of the reasons that they come up in such profusion after fire. And of course, these are not rules, exceptions to all of these adaptations exist. There are white spored um, mushrooms that come up after fire that don't seem to have a resting stage to get them through. So there's a lot that still remains to be discovered, <laughs> um, but these are some kind of general things that you might notice that a lot of these species have in common. I mentioned thick-walled spores, and uh, this is a micrograph taken by Fred Stevens, who some of you in the mycology community might know. He lives in the San Francisco Bay Area and was one of the authors of the Field Guide California Mushrooms, which is a recent field guide. And uh, yeah, so you can kind of see there's like a double wall effect that you're seeing on some of these spores. And you'll see somewhat of a thick wall in many different species of, of mushroom spores. But this is pretty, I know it may not look like much, but if you've spent a lot of time star staring at spores through a microscope, this is really dramatically thick-walled here. <laughs> <laughs> take <laughs> just your you can, word for it. Yeah, just take my word for it. <laughs> um, and the name of this fungus reflects that, Crassosporium, thick spored. Then here, here you have Funariophyllum, so chimney-loving fungus, <laughs> basically, smoke-loving. <laughs> and yeah, I'll show you a picture of their fruiting bodies here in a, in a while, but I'll also show you an orange pimply crust. Um, this is an ascum I see. A lot of the um, fungi that come up right after fire are cup fungi or relatives of cup fungi, um, like morels and like this guy. Um, not gilled mushrooms, although there are certainly are some gilled mushrooms that you'll also see. But yeah, this guy, this little orange crust, it doesn't put that much investment into its fruiting body. It's just kind of growing on the litter as a crust and then producing spores right there. This is often one of the first fungi to colonize sites after a burn. In um, both Australia and California, research has been done where people have gone out right after fire, like within a couple of weeks after the fire has gone through, and this will already be sprouting up. So it's pretty remarkably quick. What are we seeing in the, what are the little white dots all over the place? Uh, that's part of the fungus. Part of the fungus. Uh, it's fungus. just not mature yet. Yeah. yeah. And then you're seeing some little green bits of moss yeah. just starting right. to grow as well. Right. Uh, this is actually two springs after the King Fire. So even though I said these are the first to colonize, um, this area was salvage logged and then the piles were burned, slash piles were burned left over from the logging the year after the fire. So that's what I think led this to come up again was that there had been another set of disturbance and another round of fire in this particular area. And this is pretty high elevation. It's up on Chipmunk Ridge between Hellhole and French Meadows. So um, May was, and it wasn't a heavy snow year, but it was still kind of on the early side up there. Here's a post-fire community at lower elevation after the King Fire. This is the spring just after the fire. And here you see our friends, morels. Um, easy to identify, hard to spot. Um, they look like pine cones. Um, you'll also see a little brown cap of a mushroom down here. That is the one that I just showed you the thick walled spores from. That's Crassosporium funariophyllum. And then even smaller, there's this little cup, that little cup, that little cup. Uh, those are Geopixis carbonaria. So there again, you have carbon or coal in the, the root of the name here. And I 
just kind of little cop out and put um, Morchella spa up there rather than giving a species for the morel. <laughs> but um, with the burn morels especially, anybody who puts a name on a post-fire morel without doing molecular sequencing is lying to you. <laughs> they are impossible to identify, especially some of the more recently described species. The only differences that are described are differences in sequence. So I just don't even try with these guys. <laughs> Uh, perhaps we'll get some more field marks with some more collections being made, but as people tend to want to eat these rather than donate them to science, uh, progress is slow. <laughs> this is also not my photo, it's from Drew Parker who's up in Washington, and um, he posted this on iNaturalist, which uh, some of you may know, it's a very good website and app uh, on which you can post photos of any living organism, you don't have to know what it is, and people will help you identify said organism. But we get a lot of good um, mushroom photos up there. Um, birders use it too, botanists, um, entomologists, everybody. But anyway, this is a particularly pretty purple pup fungus. It's not huge, this is pretty well magnified. Um, and there are a couple of other species that look similar to this and you can only identify with a microscope. But um, yeah, another one that you see pretty soon after burn. So a couple inches across? Yeah, at most, probably two inches across. They're small. Even smaller. <laughs> we have a lot of little tiny orange cups that come up after burn. They look very similar to some little tiny orange cups that come up on dung. And some of them are closely related to the dung-loving uh, little orange cups. And probably, I mean, things that are growing on dung usually have to survive an animal's digestive tract. So they probably have a lot of the same adaptations, such as, say, thick walled spores, that fungi that fruit after fire have. So, <laughs> kind of an interesting thing. And we're talking really small. You can see that these are fern needles here. <laughs> this picture, <laughs> they're nearly microscopic. <laughs> Keeping with the small theme, these guys might be in the same genus as what I just showed you. They very well may not. You really can't identify a lot of these things without a microscope. Um, over here, uh, we have these little guys that are, again, the Crassosporium phenariophyllum, little brown gilled mushroom with the very thick walled spores. And as I say, it's very nondescript brown gilled mushroom. It's really the habitat that sets it apart because you'll see this little gilled mushroom out there, and you really won't see any other species of gilled mushrooms, or maybe one or two, um, because this is right after a fire, nothing else likes those conditions, and these are just taking full advantage and coming up, often in large numbers. More of those little orange cups. These are, I think, the same one as I showed in the first picture with the morels. They have a little bit of a white margin, and they're not as small as some. Uh, they are small, though. <laughs> and they're growing right out of uh, pretty much bare soil with some mosses, some ash. But yeah, they're not really growing from litter. They're growing right out of the dirt. This is a chunkier brown gilled mushroom that's also not that descript, but it <laughs> is a foliota, which are a, foliota as a group are brown spored uh, wood decay or litter decay uh, mushrooms. And a particular group of them likes post-fire conditions. There are several species in California which fall into this group. This is one of them. This is the chunkier one. Um, it, it's probably actually more like four to five inches across these caps. But it's not, not too small. And um, kind of whitish to pale yellow uh, stalk or stipe, and a slimy cap or sticky cap to which dirt sticks. There's also a more slender version that's more common in the spring in the mountains um, that's a closely related species that doesn't have a name yet. So I picked the one that, actually this one doesn't have a name yet either, but um, we'll call it Foliota brunescens group for now and move on. <laughs> Yes, more burn morels. Um, people want to know what they look like, and as I said, they really do look like pine cones. They're they're really tough to spot, 
in the woods. Uh, but once you get pattern recognition down for them, once you find one, then you'll see all the ones that you already stepped on. Um, <laughs> and you really can get into areas where you'll see one and then you'll see a whole field of them. They can be really abundant, as oh. many of these species can. And um, yeah, this was two springs after the King Fire. Some of these burn associated things can persist for a season or two after a fire comes through. Most of them disappear pretty quickly and are replaced by other fungi that are a little further along in the succession, things that don't prefer such recent disturbance. But some, can, some of them can keep going for a little while. So talking about mushroom communities, and particularly mycorrhizal communities and fire. And we can talk about mycorrhizal communities and disturbance of any kind, um, but there are certainly <coughs> some parts of that community which respond um, to fire primarily. This one um, is not one, well actually, I'll take it back. It is known from around here. It's known from Bullard's Bar um, up in Yuba County. It is also known from a few locations <coughs> at Point Reyes and a, it's very rarely collected from a couple of sites in Oregon and one in northern Baja. So it is a west coast specialty. It very rarely fruits. I think there are fewer than 20 collections in herbaria um, in, around the world. And when people have looked for it, they've seen it It's in the spore bank. If you take samples of soil, and dry out that soil and sequence that soil, you can find that this organism is there. Its spores are there. But where you won't find it um, is in rodent scat. And since this group, Rhizopogon and other truffle forming fungi, things that grow underground, are premium squirrel food, you'd mm -hmm. expect that even if humans aren't collecting it because we can't find it, we're not very good at finding things underground that rodents would be eating it and digesting it and leaving its spores um, around. So when you don't see that, and when you don't see it, um, collections of it by people, I should also add in here that it also was not found on root tips of mature trees. So uh, you can dig down and find the fine tips of roots and wash them off and put them through a sequencer and um, see what results you get, and that way you can find fungi that are actively colonizing and growing on that root. So if you don't find it there, um, you can assume that it's really not growing, but its spores are somehow still hanging out. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> the, spo the spores are there, but it just um, doesn't seem to be around until after fire it really readily colonizes bishop pine seedlings. This is the, from a study that was done at Point Reyes. So somehow it's hanging out, waiting for the right conditions, which would be after fire, <coughs> bishop pine is one of those that um, relies on high severity standard placing fires to kill most or all of the mature trees, and then its um, cones open. It's another serotonous species, like I was mentioning before. And then those seedlings can colonize the nice bare mineral soil that's left there. So um, this fungus is waiting there, ready to go when these seeds are ready to go. Mm -hmm. So it obviously has spores that can survive fire oh, and can survive wow. decades in the soil. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is some recent research. This is actually published in August this year out of the Friends Lab at UC Berkeley, which is a mycorrhizal ecology lab and where I did a lot of my training as an undergraduate. Uh, they showed that in greenhouse setting, if they um, exposed the roots of bishop pine seedlings that were grown in sterile conditions to this fungus, to spores of this fungus, that had not been heated, they colonized at a kind of a low rate, not a huge success rate. If they exposed sterile bishop pine seedlings to spores of this that had been heated in a drying oven to simulate the effects of fire, they just colonize like, like wildfire. <laughs> so um, 
there's something in the heating process that is stimulating the spores to germinate and be ready to colonize um, pine seedlings. And this is just one example. <laughs> is it then symbiotic? Once it's colonized? Yeah, once it's yeah. colonized the roots, it's um, mm -hmm. in its mycorrhizal relationship and it is um, getting sugars from the tree and mm -hmm. providing water and mineral nutrients to the tree in exchange for the sugars. So, mm -hmm. yeah, um, it's a pretty interesting one and I find it interesting that it's known from both Point Reyes with the Bishop Pine Forests with a high severity infrequent fire regime and from Bullard's Bar, which historically would have had a much more frequent low severity fire regime. I think it's also known from um, Yosemite. I think after the Rim Fire, some studies were done in there and showed that the, um, that species had also colonized pine roots in that area. So pretty interesting. <laughs> so. Mycorrhizal communities and fire. I think fire severity matters a lot. I think it has a, can have a huge effect on communities, but I just showed you a counterexample to that, one that doesn't seem to really care all that much. <laughs> um, it does seem that some mycorrhizal species survive fire, especially in a low severity kind of fire regime where most of the trees are surviving, and others are just really rapid recolonizers after fire. And obviously, succession does exist in these communities. Um, it seems that the rice pogon I was just talking about kind of disappears within about 10 years after a fire, and then its spores are just hanging out there in the soil waiting to be released by the next fire. Um, and then it's replaced by maybe other rice pogon species, maybe other, um, other species that aren't so closely related as the trees mature. And there have been a lot of studies done on mycorrhizal succession in um, different aged forest stands. So we do know that um, the same tree will change the kinds of fungi that it um, partners with over its lifespan. And um, often diversity increases as you get older and older trees. So a 200-year-old Douglas fir will have a much broader spectrum of species associated with its roots than an 80-year-old Douglas fir. So it makes sense. Um, and it also seems to be different um, species associated with the 200-year-old tree versus the 80-year-old tree. Not a lot of overlap. So yeah. <laughs> um, this makes you wonder about um, rarity of species and, and also how, how common things are. I mentioned that Rhizopogon seems to be pretty rare, but it's not rare right after fire. And so when we're thinking about fungal conservation, which we are starting to luckily think about, it's a pretty tough question. How do you quantify how common something is if it only fruits in these very specific conditions, but its spores are there all the time? And what about something that's completely wiped out by fire and isn't a good recolonizer? Some of these things might be way more common now because we've excluded fire from these systems for so long, but might have a much harder time if a fire regime that resembles the historical pattern was reintroduced. Um, <laughs> it's kind of, you can end up with some interesting questions if you're trying to talk conservation and like restoration objectives. It's like, well, but this isn't good for my pet species. But <laughs> no, but if you do this, it, it hurts this species, species. And so you have to have a, a lot of these conversations with a lot of different ecologists and people who are thinking about this and kind of decide which direction you want to go to have the greatest benefit uh, for the greatest number of species. Or maybe in some cases, it's conserving a rare species against um, what conditions would be better or more representative of how things should be. So it's a tough call. But it's a very interesting one, and it keeps me wanting to learn more. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, I really want to thank um, some people who have been big influences on me and my um, studies and my employment. Eric Knapp is an, a fire ecologist with the Forest Service, and he gave me my first Forest Service job. 
uh, doing pre-fire um, study, er, pre-fire and mechanical treatment studies of forest structure in the Stanislaw Twalmy Experimental Forest down north, just north of Yosemite. Scott Stevens is a professor of mine in fire science at Berkeley, and if you're really interested in fire ecology and want to do some further reading, both of these men have incredible publications that are available, some of them freely because some of them are government publications. Um, so yeah, if you want to do more reading, look these guys up. And then Tom Bruns and Elsa Valinga, also of UC Berkeley, are my mycology mentors and have done really incredible work in both fungal ecology and taxonomy. So with that, I'll close and I'll take any questions that people have.